Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It is a noon hour in Honolulu, folks. Ed Rawson here with our Think Tech Studio show, Where the Drone Leads. And by uh, amazing circumstance, we have online with us, uh, all the way from Washington, D.C., Mr. Brian Wynn, who is the president and CEO of AUVSI. A little bit hard to pronounce, but a lot to remember. The Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. Big operation. Anyway, Brian, uh, you're here with us again. Thanks for coming on last year and the year before. We were just talking before the show began about uh, the kind of the role that the conferences play in pulling together people who are people and ideas and things and academia and, and, and uh, the fabrication companies that are dealing with the emerging uh, domain of unmanned earth systems. And you sit on top of that, Brian, running Exponential, the largest of these uh, drone-related, UAS-related conferences in the, in the world, frankly. Uh, and you just came off the, the last one, and you're heading for the next one. So in the middle of all this, uh, you've got to keep your eye on the ball of all these new developments that are happening and new trends and somehow pull those strings together into an annual conference. How does that go, Brian? Well, first off, Ted, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be back. And uh, and as you can see, I've worn my Hawaiian my Hawaiian garb. I, I'll, I'll not turn around and show you the rooster that I've got because I'm a year out of date. But uh, uh, bought this uh, shirt, I think, about two years ago now because we're getting ready for Robot X in uh, Honolulu. Uh, our foundation, I should say, Robo Nation, is getting ready. And uh, 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 Daryl Anderson, who Daryl Davidson, excuse me, who runs that organization and used to run AUBSI, uh, is pressing me to come with uh, to be out there. So always looking for an opportunity. Uh, and thanks for bringing up Exponential. It's a great show. It's uh, used to be called Unmanned Systems. We changed the name of it in 2015 to Exponential. That seemed to be the, the word that captured what's going on in our community the best. And you're right, the, the, the planning for that event is essentially perpetual. Um, we, we've been working on our event for in Chicago, which will be the next venue uh, in May, uh, late April, early May of 2019 for about two years now, and uh, already started working on the event that starts after that in Boston. Um, and, and somewhere in there, uh, through the magic of, of people collaborating with one another, uh, we, we end up with some very, very timely presentations. Uh, and I like to think we, we have the best platform for folks coming together that need to collaborate with one another. So in general terms, uh, when, when you say I sit at the top of it, that, that means I'm really a good host. Uh, I, I like to say I'm, I'm hosting 8,000 of my closest friends, which is about where the attendance uh, stands at this point. But it's getting bigger every year, and I would say the number of people, the kinds of people that are coming to the event are getting more diverse. That's a good thing, given all the work that needs to be done and the, the, the talent that we need to draw from to get it done. You know, and, and, and mentioning that, the issue of the talent and such and the direction things are going, well, people that I interviewed who uh, had met, been at the last uh, event uh, were, were struck by the emergence of standards and best practices and this type of semi-regulation, if you will, that's starting to percolate the domain of business and, and academia. And uh, that's just one example of the kind of new theme that's coming into the, into the business. But there must be other themes as well. Uh, for example, I just got a note this morning from our Honolulu Fire Department, very proud of their uh, a COA they've arrived at and very proud of their first use of UAS in public safety. We've got a lot of work going on down at the volcano in Kilauea where uh, UAS have been essential. Of so uh, as these new themes come together, uh, the conference has to sort of somehow grab them and embrace them and, and allow a, a vector to form around that, uh, around those, these new d dimensions. So keeping it all current and, and, and uh, Dealing with how fast things change certainly must be uh, an interesting challenge for you. Well, it's one that we welcome. And the way I think about it, public safety is actually a really good example of a community that is embracing unmanned systems, what, if we're just talking about the air side, but not just. Um, and it, 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 whether it's for search and rescue, whether it's for uh, on site, so you've got all the different folks in law, in law enforcement, you've got the firefighters, you've got wildland fire preve uh, prevention and, uh, and fighting, uh, 
um, and, and there's there's uh, search and rescue, et cetera. Well, we did the way way we use our platform is we invite communities like that to come in. Uh, they they use it to share information about best practices. Some of those things ultimately will become standards, and I'll come back to that in just a quick second. But I think the power of, of what it is that we're able to do on a platform like that, because remember, it's only four days out of the year, and we work you know the year round, uh, is we can get these different communities talking to each other and learning from one another. Public safety is such a broad category, of course, uh, and, and I think you know those guys, interestingly, have been learning also from the defense side, which I know you're connected to as well. Uh, they're in some ways using best practices from some of the early adopters of this technology. And, um, and, and that's really gratifying to see when those communities start talking to one another and they can kind of give each other a leg up. So we, we actually put an entire, not, it wasn't just a track of public safety, we actually had a separate event that we did in conjunction uh, with the national uh, chapter, the national capital. Uh, sorry, I'm going to not quite get this exactly right, uh, but it was public safety UAS basically, and um, and, and we did do a, a separate track, but we also had a separate events where so folks could come and, and work with one another. Um, so that but that goes on all the time. We're not just exponential isn't the only event that we run. We also saw that quite significantly at uh, another event that we have uh, been building over time, and that's unmanned systems defense protection security. Uh, there seems to be uh, th those communities, the defense community, the uh, public safety community, uh, and, and those that are interested in, in for example, mitigation of uh, potential bad uh, drones, et cetera, so counter UAS. We've been getting those folks together on yet another platform uh, that ha that occurs here in the Washington D.C. area. So there's lots of different ways that we do that, and uh, uh, and frankly, it's one of the most gratifying things about the association business is seeing people come together uh, and and helping one another and and creating shortcuts so that one community can get up to speed faster. No, that's a really great. Uh uh, approach to putting it all together, and I'll tell you, as a as a attendee of uh, several uh, exponentials, and even before it was called exponential, I can I can tell you that it is a uh, almost an overwhelming experience, for, especially for first timers, because you're not quite sure which direction to go, and there's stuff everywhere. It's all attractive, it's all something you want to pay attention to, and and yet there's also uh, side conferences going on at the same time, side meetings and so, so it's a it's a it's a challenge to the to the user to get as much out of it as they possibly can. And when you're done, you say, "My God, there's I did one out of ten things I had anticipated doing." But one thing I, I uh, would like to to suggest or uh, maybe discuss is another factor that's coming around is sort of standardization in legislation or uh, or good best practices in legislation. Uh, I know I work with our legislature here, and I know other people do, uh, Charles Warner does, and others involved, in, and, and getting a, a, a good set of, uh, of rules that, that permit and control UAS is an important thing to a lot of our legislative uh, people. The trouble is they don't have much time to study anything. They've got to give it, have it given to them, kind of packaged, and if it references Pennsylvania and Arizona and something else and it all looks good, it, it goes much better. Uh, would, is that something reasonable to to have in the in the in the conference a uh, continuing visit of where effective legislation is uh, can be discussed? Yeah, you know, I, I think we do cover some of that in our policy tracks, but the um, uh, you raise an interesting point because I think we have increasingly been working at st in state legislatures directly. Uh, as you know, we have very good chapters around the, the country and a couple of places outside the country. Uh, for our, our chapters in the U.S., many of them have been uh, our boots on the ground, if you will, in educating legislators about what a great opportunity this is, uh, how it can be a great benefit to uh, both jobs as well as, as uh, a, a variety of other things that are important to them in their state. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think, how do we bring that together? So we've been talking about that in our, our chapter council. We have our chapter president's council, and 
that group has gotten very sophisticated over time and is now meeting twice a year. Uh, once a year it meets at Exponential and uh, we're gonna host it during our, our uh, Hill Day, which is coming up in September on the 26th here in Washington, D.C. Uh, so increasingly, we, we are looking for where are the opportunities where we can provide those best practices. And of course, that merges into the conversation about, if we're talking about the air side, what's the role of state and local and tribal authorities in, uh, in, in helping to develop a framework uh, that, and the tools that we can all use because most of the flying for small UAS, of course, is local flying. So um, that's been a very robust conversation, as you know, not always a happy one, uh, because we don't really have too many uh, ways of, of, of attacking that. But now we do, and, and that's the, uh, the integrated pilot project that are going on. And, um, uh, and I think you know, we'll be hearing a lot more about that over time. So I've been, of course, supporting that from the very beginning and uh, as a member of both the DAC, the Drone Advisory Committee, and the MAC, the Ma uh, Management Advisory Council for the FAA Administrator, uh, we, we've really been emphasizing how important we think that is. That's really cool, and then the IPP is really a good example of, uh, of where these things all come together. The best practices and the, the rules can be tested in that IPP environment. We are part of Alaska in their IPP uh, solicitation, and. Um, we had made an independent one as Hawaii didn't get, didn't get selected on the first round, but we did incredibly get a call from the FAA saying, you didn't get selected, but guess what, we're here to help. So if there's a way you want to apply some of these IPP concepts going forward, let's work together. And actually, our, exam, our experience over at Kilauea in the volcano is uh, leading in the direction of, of, uh, of trying to find a way to air boss our way in through a, a, a system that, that respects everyone, respects the manned uh, aviation that's in the area, respects the need of the news services to get in and get information that the, isn't necessarily available otherwise. And also, there's got to be a place where the, where the experimentation people uh, can play. So we really haven't achieved that, but I think uh, following under an IPP-like uh, structured thinking would let us uh, at least consider what, uh, what might be an appropriate way to go forward. But once again, like we were saying it to be, earlier on, standards are coming, ADSB is coming. Uh, there are just a, no end of things that are happening coming forward, and, uh, it, and, and we, we trust you to keep your eye on all that stuff and, 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 and package it in such a way that it's easy for us to access, access through, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, through the conferences. So let, but let's get back to the standards thing in a minute. We'll take a break here for about a minute and then get back and talk about how the whole standards uh, world is moving forward. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on Think Tech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on ThinkTech Hawaii called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Still the noon hour, folks. Ted Ralston here in Honolulu and Brian Wynn in Washington, D.C. Brian uh, joining us on the Where the Drone Leads, speaking from the very top of the business and the profession of droneism as, chair, as president and uh, CEO of uh, AUVSI, Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. We had a robust discussion about uh, how exciting the exponential conferences are that uh, Brian's organization puts on, bringing us all together and bringing information to the, the folks who are looking for it. But we were talking a little bit about standards. 
And uh, again, one of my guys who was at the conference this year was struck by the, by the strong emergence of standards and best practices throughout the, the conference. And he heard that mentioned and, and saw it uh, in, in, in discussion items. So talk about what your perspective is, Brian, of the emerging and sort of coalescing standards that are going to be driving this, what do we call it, uh, self-regulated industry? Well, we hope it's self-regulated increasingly. I, I think it, it's, um, it's very interesting to me as an aviator that how much of what goes on in aviation is well beyond the regulatory environment. It's driven by uh, just safety considerations, good pra best practices and safety, uh, and, and so forth. So you've got all kinds of certification programs that, uh, that, that, that go forward, and then insurance starts to have their own requirements that they kind of layer on uh, as best practices become more obvious. Uh, it, we're trying to do the same thing, essentially, in the world of drones. We're basically saying, hey, give us the basic framework, please, FAA. Give us uh, the kind of safety considerations that you think are critical, and then let us as an industry go forward uh, and meet those performance requirements with best practices and allow us to incorporate advanced technologies as they become available. Um, because that's the tricky part. I mean, this industry is moving so fast, the technology is advancing so quickly uh, that we'll get better and better at this. And if we try to be too, if the FAA is too, too prescriptive, uh, then we're probably going to fall behind. Uh, they will certainly fall further behind. I would argue they're already behind. But let me give one good example of how the community has come together. Uh, you mentioned ASTM. I know F38 has been working on, on, on you know, what kinds of requirements should there be out there for pilots. Of course, in the man community, we have these things, you know, the books that say, you know, if you want to be a commercial pilot, here are the standards that you, you need to meet. We don't have those things for the unmanned systems community. And so we've kind of taken it upon ourselves in AUVSI to get together the folks that are doing that training or putting together those standards to see if we can get everybody into alignment in what we're calling the Trusted Operator Program. And there's more on the AUVSI.org website about the Trusted Operator Program, which is about to actually roll out into the marketplace. And it's not to supplant anything that's out there. It's actually meant to bring things together uh, so that those that are putting together training programs, whether it is in the public safety community, as we were talking about before, uh, or in the utility community, or in the oil and gas industry, uh, or some of the scientific communities, they've got something that they can reach for. Uh, and when they their their pilots are trained to that level, or they go through training programs that are at that that are basically recognized under the trusted operator program, the market will be able to recognize that. It's not meant to supplant the FAA. It's meant to take control uh, in an area where the community can help itself and raise the levels of professionalism and, and uh, uh, that we all need in order to actually get this technology and its applications to the mainstream. You know, this, uh, and education is the underlying term in what you just went through. And, uh, uh, yes, yes. and it, an education vector or theme at the conference at the Exponential would be a really interesting and, and attractive uh, uh, element to participate in. Just a couple of examples here. We found that at the university, uh, we have an obligation through our community colleges and the university itself to provide some form of education to people who bought UAS and don't quite know how to take them out of the box yet. So we've got a, we ran a couple of boot camps that are basically about that. How do you take it out of the box? What do you do next? Sometimes these things, I guess, are intimidating. And so it stays in a box when they buy it. But we've found that to be a, a necessary element of the uh, education. Another piece that was incredible was a, uh, the FAA here, our good friends at the FISDO, would like very much to be able to reach out to the communities that are around the, the Bravo airspace and Delta airspace in the airports, thinking that the schools in those areas are where the people are who are going to be operating drones in that area. So why not have a connection between the local FAA, the tower will say, and the local community collected at the school, you get the teachers, the kids, the parents, the siblings, and start passing the word. And lo and behold, we actually had one of those events a couple of months ago, and 200 people showed up. FAA was part of it from the tower, and they found a means to connect directly with the community that's using their airspace. And the community 
got to see live, living human beings called the FAA, which is something you don't often see. So we're going to continue that. In fact, on this show, the next time we have this show, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, sharing the airspace with the tour helicopter people. And the FAA will, will be part of that. So anyway, education in all forms seems to be in, in, uh, in, in, in a, a, a something that is not even achievable. There's so much education required. We, and one of, our, one of my peers, uh, Josh Levy, is uh, leading that activity for the university. But we'll look for every opportunity we can to steal from anybody who's got bright educational ideas. And this trusted uh, operator concept that uh, you brought up sounds like a great one to bring into our own programs. So is there a way that we as a university can somehow link in with that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and before we, I, I can't let it go by. It's so gratifying uh, what it is that you just described, having people interact with each other. You know, it, it's, it's so gratifying to see that happen. Uh, the Trusted Operating Program actually came out of a, a, a series of meetings, I want to say listening tour that I did uh, with Michael Wilbur, our membership manager, uh, where I think we were in ultimately in about 12 different places. I might have participated in, missed one of those meetings, but I was in as many of them as possible. We always had someone there from the FAA. I call him the bravest guy working for the FAA because he came out to meet the remote pilots and in some instances, you know, got some feedback that, well, you know, typical feedback that the FAA is probably used to from us man flyers as well. So, uh, but he, he was really great about welcoming that feedback. Uh, he's a member of the FAST team, FAA safety team. Uh, and so we're looking at how this program fits into wings and so forth mm -hmm. and so on. We're trying to leverage the best practices that are already out there for manned aviation and the structures that are there as well. But to your point, I know that, that, that your university probably does a great job doing the education. The question is, is, is it benefiting from what's happening in other places as well? So it, it's kind of a how do we get the top the bottom up that you just described, and I participated and saw some of those connections being made in a number of different uh, locations with the top down where people are working together to get the, the into alignment, what we like to call the protocols of safety at different levels so that the marketplace has the ability to test the veracity when you say, hey, I, I'm, one of, I'm one of the best flyers out there. I went to this fantastic Cracker Jack training program. Um, I thought me a utility guy and you're gonna fly near my substation. I wanna make sure you're not gonna crash and knock out my grid. Give me something that allows me to test the veracity of what you're saying. That's kind of the top down approach. But when I say top down, uh, I think we had 170 odd, maybe 180 people who were in the training business, in the certification business, in the from the the flight safety arena, come together to put these protocols together, and we leveraged the standards that were already being worked on. So that manual is going to be coming out. It will be available to you and others, um, and we hope that mark will become uh, recognized so that the marketplace in general will be able to say, okay, I see that you've been trained to those kinds of levels and protocols. Uh, I can trust you to, to fly around my oil platform or fly around my utility grid or whatever. That's an essentially critical element of this whole activity is getting that kind of standardization in awareness, education, and, and information. Because I think of all the uh, certifications you can take in the FAA, unmanned, remote pilot, the 107, is the only one that doesn't have practical experience associated with it. Since That's you right. don't have the practical experience, since you don't have to do flight testing or even uh, you take any classes, you don't have that, that social transfer of information that comes from people who operate and you can sort out things on your own. You have this book learning you did and you pass the knowledge test, but it, it slips away pretty quickly. And it doesn't have practical application until you put something together like you've done. So we are looking forward to jumping in on that. We've worked with AOPA and AMA also who have forms of educational, all three together would probably be the, the best mix here. So uh, we're nearing the end of our time here, but uh, we of course run out of time before we run out of subjects to talk about in this game. But exactly. it, education and, and standard practices, including legislation, those are, would be really, in, to me, really important elements of going, going forward in the future in, in the conferences. and. Uh, uh, looking forward to uh, participating in, in that sort of thing. 
Uh, but the standards, uh, what other standards do you see coming? Are we going to see co uh, standards in, uh, in radio communication and in spectrum and in, uh, in uh, other technical aspects, materials? Uh, how, how do you see it yeah, all unfolding? Let's use radio, I, or sorry, uh, remote identification, which you brought up a little bit earlier, as a good example of this. Now, we, we, we all agree that anonymous flying is making folks nervous. We've had uh, security agencies weigh in at the federal level, slow down uh, efforts to get flight over people, for example. Uh, so the industry came together in an ARC, an Aviation Rulemaking Committee, provided feedback to the FAA on how we would do remote identification. In the end, this is a class, one of those classic examples of something that we need to do, and we need to do it in a way that's performance-based because the way we will do it will get better over time. Um, and we also need to leave room for multiple solutions here rather than being prescriptive and saying everybody needs to use this particular approach. So, but I think in there is, is the, the kind of give and take that we're looking for from the regulator a codify what it is that you need from a performance basis so that whether it's a cop on the beat or somebody who's trying to protect critical infrastructure has the ability to identify a drone and who's flying that drone and satisfy themselves that it's an authorized operation. Um, and, and the industry is able to comply with that using standards that it has come together and put together uh, for purposes of that remote identification performance requirement. So th those are the kinds of things that are going on. I would say remote identification in the regulatory environment because of what I described uh, with flight over people is probably the most important thing that we're waiting on right now. And once we've got it, it's gonna, it's gonna demand that we as an industry come up with some standards for doing it so that people who need to know who's flying a particular drone can get access to that information that people don't need to know will not be able to get access to that information. We know how to do that. We know how to do basic IFF technologies. Um, but in this case, we need, we need to promulgate that rule throughout the United States. And frankly, if we can figure out a way to get it done in the United States, we can figure out a way to get it done in, in other parts of the world as well. That's a really good example because it, it brings together uh, personal responsibility, behavior, regulation, technology, and, and advancing the state of the art. It all, that's, that's that one element, the, the uh, electronic identification, really touches all aspects. And uh, so that's a, a third vector to have in the, uh, in the conference series is these innovative ways to go ahead and, uh, and, and protect the future but expand it. And at this point in time, uh, we are absolutely uh, have shot our 30-minute time period here. And Brian Wynn, uh, President and CEO of AUVSI, thank you very much for your great insight on this show. And we'll see you in Boston, and then uh, see you on the show after that again. Well, don't forget oh, Chicago. Chicago. Chicago's next, we'll go to Boston Chicago, then Boston, that, right? Then so. Honolulu. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, right. thanks so much for coming on, Brian. Okay. My great pleasure. Thank you.